Good morning and welcome to MZ Webinars. Fantastic you're with us today. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be discussing the second part of our skills advisory panel and how we're meeting the DFA requirements. A bit more practical this time. So we have Will Cookson with us today, who is the Director of Economic Development for MZ, and also Duncan Brown, who is our Senior Economist. So um, we are going to answer questions if there is any at the end of the um, broadcast. So if you'd like to put them in your control panel, we'll get to them as soon as we can. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Will. Good morning, Will. Morning, Debbie, and morning, Duncan. So yes, um, this is the follow-up on last week's webinar. Last week's webinar, we focused very much on the supply and demand analysis part of the DFE um, requirements in regards to skills advisory panels. We're going to broaden that out um, this week, and we're joined by Duncan Brown, as Debbie's mentioned. And Duncan's going to take us through some other analysis that could be applied, um, really looking at the DFE requirements in a broader sense. So without further ado, I will move on. So the agenda, um, we'll do the introduction, or we have just to have. We'll have a quick look at the role of SAPs and MZ data. Uh, we'll go through that quite quickly. Then we get on to the balancing of the DFE and anal uh, analytical framework. So really what scope there is to look at broader questions and broader context and how that applies potentially to other pieces of work, um, for example, around the localization of the industrial strategy. We'll have a look at technology and migration, looking at automation there. And we'll also have a look at productivity going down to a town level. And then we'll also look at some skill sets or clusters of skill sets using our job posting analytics. And then we'll do a summary at the end. So yes, um, apologies for anyone who's there, there um, joined us last week, um, as this is very similar. Um, unsurprisingly, it hasn't changed. Requirements of the skills advisory panels obviously to understand current future skills needs, labour market challenges. Um, those are local partnerships, bringing in public and private sector employees, local authorities and the provider base through colleges and universities. Um, obviously, LEPs and mayoral combined authorities are responsible for decisions on how large amounts of public funding are spent. And to do that effectively, they really need to understand current and future skills demand in local areas. Um, MZ, um, essentially, um, as you're probably aware, um, our mission is to help people make better decisions relating to the world of work. And we do that through the provision of robust, detailed and localised labour market in a proprietary data set. So robust job counts in all four digit occupations and industries going back to 2003 with trend-based projections made forward to 2027. Also estimates of job openings for four-digit occupations through to 2027. Um, and obviously, um, as you may know, if you've joined some previous webinars, we also have job posting data, which captures around 800,000 unique postings every month. And we'll be looking at how that can be used to support the skills advisory panel work um, within this webinar. So, um, yeah, it's probably a good time to introduce uh, Duncan. Um, essentially, we are going to um, today look at the balancing the analytical framework that DFE have set out. Um, it's a useful guide and a great starting point for the work of skills advisory panels. Um, but there's the letter and the spirit. So the letter in regards to the analytical framework is exhaustive, comprehensive. Um, and probably not feasible. Would you agree, Duncan? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, 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 by the way, I realised after I put this slide together that, of course, it's the analytical toolkit, not the analytical framework. So uh, uh, apologies on that score. But yeah, I, I think that uh, there's so many headings in the analytical toolkit uh, that they want you to cover, you know, uh, uh, including stuff that is obviously has impact on skills issues. Um, but is yeah, but our areas of you know big questions anyway. So things like transport and housing, and uh, uh, you know Brexit is in there. Um, and then there's you know some very specific uh, things that they say in there. Things like you know 
what's the impact of uh, uh, the introduction of uh, universal credit or the national minimum wage and you know you could spend quite a bit of time on just any one of those individual questions um, and uh, you know uh, and potentially quite significant money as well to try and get a, an answer down to a local level and uh, I think that's the thing it's kind of you know the toolkit is full of really important and interesting questions but uh, w how much of it can actually be delivered feasibly in the time and budget available is you know a, a separate question really yes um and, and and i suppose that brings us back to the 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 spirit of it and we covered this quite in some quite some detail last week hmm. the spirit of it and the the core aim in the core analysis is around demand and supply of skills but today um we're going to be looking at whether there's content and analysis that can be um that can be um actioned that can then relate to the work in regards to the list work or the context of the list and some of the wider questions um raised by the analytical toolkit so yeah uh, we, fact, should yeah. we move on and um wow we have um a bubble chart yeah it's a very messy bubble chart it's kind of uh uh, 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 like a, uh, a a bit of a, a expression abstract expressionist painting in a way, but um, so yeah, I, was, I was thinking of Damien Hurst when when this yeah, one popped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe. Um, so uh, uh, what this chart does is really get at two kind of big questions that kind of uh, 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 weigh heavily on discussions about the future trends of the labour market, and so. Um, what we've done so each of the balls represents an occupation so there's uh, 360 uh, odd occupations uh, in the uh, ons SOC taxonomy and each of those balls represents one of them and you'll see that they're yeah, colored as well so the purple ones are high skilled so that's managerial professional and technical the yellow ones are labor intensive so it's things like plant workers and uh, uh, elementary roles as well and then the sort of the the bluish ones are middle skilled, so things like skilled trades and secretarial work. And then the green ones are service workers, so a lot of uh, caring, leisure, sort of uh, sales and those kind of workers in there. And what we've done is we scored each one according to two things. So one of them is on uh, automation, so their exposure to changing technology over the next 20 or so years. Um, and then the other one is migration. So what we've done there is we've scored them in terms of uh, their reliance on recent migration to meet their labour market needs. And so that allows us, and we've done each of them by percentile, so uh, they're on a consistent scale. Uh, and so if you're at the sort of the, the very top right, like uh, cleaners are and uh, 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 waiters and waitresses, then they're the kind of jobs that are highly automatable given to, to technology trends over the next uh, few decades, but also highly reliant, some of the most reliant on migrant labor, uh, recent migrant labor at that. And so what we can do is uh, draw out these four quadrants that we've done. So uh, uh, if you're at, on the top right, you're, you're an occupation that is using a lot of migrant labor, but could also be substituted for technology in the, uh, the years ahead. If you're at the, uh, the top left, these are quite interesting jobs. These are jobs that are using a lot of migrant labor, but are also quite difficult to automate. So things like care workers come in there, uh, chefs are in there at the top as well. And then these jobs at the bottom left are jobs that are less reliant on migrant labor, but also difficult to automate. And then the jobs at the bottom uh, right are jobs that haven't been drawn on a lot of migrant labor, but are also facing a lot of technology challenges in the years ahead as well. And so uh, uh, where occupations sit, you know, and their trajectory in the labour market uh, uh, compared to their potential risk of automation is quite an interesting conjunction, I think. A um, couple of questions, Duncan. The size of the um, the bubbles that we're looking at, is that in relation to the, the proportion of those occupations at this area yeah. that we're looking at? Yeah, the number of jobs. So, yeah, you can see, and, and it's the larger ones that are all labelled because obviously having 200 odd labels on the screen would get a bit too messy. Yeah. I suppose the, the big question is um, how much this will differ locally. Um, yeah, indeed. Yeah, 
quite a lot is the answer on that one as you'd imagine uh, the the mix of occupations in itself will will vary quite significantly if you've got uh, 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 certain kinds of industries uh, if you can see up there on the top right kitchen uh, assistants and waiters and waitresses obviously in areas with uh, you know like the center of london you'll get a lot of those um, and uh, some of the other roles that are up there, things like LGV drivers and storage workers uh, are in very different parts across the country as well. So yeah, th there will be quite a, a big mix from that. And of course also how much migrant labor is used will also vary um, depending on the availability around the country as well. And when we're talking about migrant labor, we're talking about migrant labor from out of the area. Yeah, well, no, in this case, it is international migrant labour, although, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's more difficult to get um, data on uh, internal migrant labour uh, uh, at an occupation level. But it does give you a sense of how much um, industries are relying on exterior sources uh, to meet their labour market needs. And, and of course, this has big impacts, really, on sort of... Uh, uh, economic strategy decision making really you know if you've got a lot of jobs in that top right, right quadrant then potentially you're growing lots of jobs that um, are dependent on uh, bringing in new workers for them but actually in the medium term the sort of the technology uh, risk to those jobs is quite high and so it's kind of almost that you're growing jobs in areas where uh, and uh, they might not be needed long term. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, it puts a different spin on the straightforward technology question. You know, some jobs are going to face a lot of automation risk. That's fine. But of course, uh, the question is, which of those jobs that we're actually busily building up at the moment, even though in the long run, they might not be so needed? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, I think it's one of the cross cutting themes. <laughs> that we'll come across within the, within this webinar but more broadly within this piece of work which is about that mix and balance yeah of within your economy yeah okay. absolutely right i'm just going to move on um we're going to jump on to uh productivity yeah um, so Go yeah on. completely uh completely different picture we've got here but talk us through it duncan what are we looking at yeah so what i've done here is i've taken a region on the bottom chart and then i've taken great britain as a whole and i've uh, aggregated up all the industries into seven large groupings so you've got uh, at the bottom there you can see agriculture mining and utilities financial insurance and real estate manufacturing and so on. and what we have done is we've measured each one by the gva per job and mm. um, so that's a measure of productivity in itself and then we've um, uh, um, put the width of each bar in terms of the uh, percentage of jobs that that industry represents. And so, um, uh, uh, and then we've ranked them in terms of their productivity. And so you can see the region there at the bottom uh, actually has um, uh, uh, um, its highest productivities in agriculture, mining and utilities, which sets it apart from the GB picture where the highest productivity is in financial insurance and real estate. Mm. And so really what I wanted to show with this is that when we talk about productivity of an area, actually it's the kind of, uh, it's dividing one big number GVA by another big number uh, jobs or uh, any other measure of labor input. And, uh, and actually it's the sort of the interactions at industry level that are actually in some ways a lot more interesting. So you can see here, that as i say agriculture mining and utilities is actually not only the most productive area uh, industry in that region but it's also more productive than it is nationally you mm. can see there that in the region it's kind of around eighty thousand pound per job whereas nationally it's more like sixty thousand pounds per job um and so it's actually the sort of the uh, 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 the total productivity picture can be explained by two things one is uh, how high productivity is in individual industries and the other is uh, how uh, those industries are, are making up the local economy. So, for example, you can have a region which has got, you know, actually a fairly unproductive uh, digital sector, but because that digital sector is large um, uh, and digital generally is quite high productivity, um, uh, then that means that the region as a whole becomes very productive. And so actually understanding uh, the contribution as to whether the level of productivity in each industry is high or low compared to the national benchmark and the sort of the mix of industry are both really important in understanding what productivity means in your local area. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so again, a recurring theme of um, how every area is different, but understanding those differences in regards to productivity 
um, I can see that as a clear link through to the work that LEPs are doing in regards to the localization of the industrial strategy and yeah. more broadly in regards to how they are engaging and working with their uh, employer base. Really interesting. Okay, I'm going to move on and we're going to talk about local detail. Yes, uh, and so um, of course a lot of discussion, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, SAP work is being done at that region level um, and of course for a lot of these questions that's exactly the level that you need to be thinking about because of course people do move around and travel to work is important and all of that but at the same time you know we are getting a lot more interest um, you know the government has uh, um, announced new funding for uh, town level interventions there's you know an increasing interest in what goes on in towns uh, outside of our major cities and and yeah that that's as it should be I, I think in some ways it, it's quite a misleading debate because uh, we often focus on towns as if they're all struggling and many are but of course also there are some other towns that are really quite interesting as and dynamic as well um, but actually you know getting to grips with the town level economy is quite important and interesting and in many ways we need to go below the normal level of data uh, that you uh, uh, see in most uh, um, uh, data sources, including our own tools as well. And so I've just put this example together here. This is the digital uh, cluster of industries in uh, uh, three uh, local authorities in the Thames Valley area. And really I've just focused on, you know, so the scale is location quotient. And so you can see there the yellow bit just uh, outside Reading, um, uh, uh, which has got a location quotient of about 14, I think. And that, of course, is where Oracle and Microsoft are based. You can see that other uh, green part there where Verizon and Huawei are based, and then Vodafone north of Newbury over there on the left. And so it's getting to grips with these sort of really local patterns, which is really quite important uh, to get a handle on where, uh, how economic strategy can make a difference down to this local level. And, of course, this has big implications uh, not just for SAP, but for Liz as well, you know, uh, actually thinking about the structure of the economy. And of course, for a lot of LEPs, actually their geography is uh, uh, characterised more by towns than by cities. You know, I mean, you've obviously got uh, uh, many LEPs and combined authorities where they have a major urban centre. And of course, that's really important and they, they play a huge role in our economy. But there are many regions around the country where, you know, uh, it is, you know, there is no single kind of uh, at, at North Star urban centre that guides their activity. It's actually a, 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 a group of towns and how the economic interactions and the distribution of industry works between them is really important. There's, there, yeah, it's a broad, it does link partly to our um, town's traction scorecard as well in that really? there's, there's that challenge in regards to retaining talent. So we know from conversations with our LEP customers one of the challenges they face is that the um, a, a large proportion of the talent within their workforce will will um, yeah will commute out of area in order to work, and one of the challenges they're looking at is how that can be retained in area. So I yeah. think this yeah this type of analysis is quite useful in regards to that that challenge. Okay, so skill sets. Okay, this is a reasonably new one on me not skill sets themselves but I believe they've been clustered in this instance yeah so what we did um, in one part of the uh, UK is we took um, the skills so uh, we collect job postings as you said earlier and we tag job postings for all of the uh, skills that are mentioned in there and so we have a taxonomy in thousands of skills and and, and you know that's powerful data in and of itself but of course, actually, it's understanding the sort of the underlying trends that is really valuable uh, for decision making. So what we did here, we sort of picked out the 20 top skill sets that represent clusters of, of those individual skills within them. And so, for example, if you've got something like software engineering, it will have a range of different programming languages and programming methods in there, um, as well as some of the skills that go uh, with it. And so in many ways they show a more interesting pattern uh, that allows us to just distill what's going on and so uh, all of the job postings that have got a significant link to one of these skills clusters are used to measure on the x-axis how uh, important they are over the past year 
in the city region. Um, but then also what we've done on the y-axis is seek to measure how acute the recruitment need is. And what we've done is we've taken uh, the percentage of those job postings that have a, a, a posting duration, which is how long the posting is online for, that's in the top quartile for that region. So it's about uh, over 40 days, I think it is. And so what you can see here is that you've got something like cleaning and hygiene, which is a sought after skill set, um, you know, not a particularly highly uh, uh, rewarded one, but it is, you know, uh, uh, over 60,000 postings. But what you can see is, uh, if you look on the y-axis, it's quite low down. It's not particularly difficult to recruit for. Whereas if you look at the top left, you can see welding up there. It's not many postings, you know, a few thousand over the past year, uh, but it's actually you know, really difficult to get a hold of. You know, it's about 12% of postings go over 40 days. Um, and accountancy is up there as well. And then you've got this family of uh, uh, the uh, digital ones uh, in the middle, which are quite difficult to get a hold of, but again, quite small in volume. Um, so we've done this across the whole labour market. We are looking to develop it further uh, into individual career areas where it allows to more uh, uh, get a closer feel for uh, the different jobs at stake. And of course, you know, oftentimes the, the sort of the size of these um, uh, uh, um, skill set demands can belie their importance to a local economy. If you can't get welders, then a lot of your manufacturing industry might be struggling. Yeah, it's how they're interlinked within each other's supply chain, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, really interesting to see them clustered in that way. Having uh, Obviously, we use the job posting analytics um, a lot to understand recruitment activity. Um, but you do tend to, you often see quite generic skills being um, requested, not to say they're not important, but quite interesting to then look at it by um, clustering them together. Yeah. Gives us a more um, nuanced view of it. Yeah. So I'm just going to check whether we've got any questions. Uh, let me just check. I've had a quick look, Will, and we don't yeah. seem to have any questions, so that's great. I'm assuming that Duncan's explained everything absolutely clearly um, as, usual. <laughs> as usual yeah um, I, okay that's great um, I just want to do a quick summary um, so what do we look at we, we started off talking um, about the balance within the DFE and analytical toolkit um, there's a lot in there um, trying to obviously we see that core requirement around supply and demand analysis which we went into more detail la on last week's webinar and then it was about trying to pull out some of the things that have a potential link between the SAP work and the localization of the industrial strategy or the LIS analysis so it's about that balance there between the two um, and also I guess focusing on what we've tended to do here is focus on where where there is available data um, which isn't going to um, come with a significant amount of um, work or cost, as Duncan alluded to earlier. We then had a look at um, automation and migration. Um, we looked at, uh, we then looked at productivity, some town level analysis as well, um, to understand productivity at that town level. And then we went back to job posting analytics, but looked at skills clusters. Um, and as Duncan said, there'll be more work being done on that. So um, as we haven't got any questions, I'm just going to move on. Um, I just want to let everyone know, I mentioned this on last week's webinar, um, we're going to have an economic development forum. Uh, first one of these, uh, predominantly for customers. Um, we're going to be looking at the evidence base that MZ provides. Uh, Duncan will be joining us and we're going to be looking at understanding how that evidence base can be used to help solve regional economic challenges. So um, yes, put this date in your diary, 24th of October. It will be free to attend and it's going to be at the studio in Birmingham, which is where we had our annual conference for anyone who attended. Um, so I think uh, just leaves me to thank Debbie and Duncan for joining me today. And um, if you do need to make contact, my contact details are here. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.